Kingdom House. How are you guys doing? Good. How many of you were excited to be here until you found out Pastor Troy wasn't here? Well, we're going to have fun. We've had a great time today. Uh, the first two services, I'm excited to be able to share with you guys here. Uh, third service. But before we get started, it's something I've done both services, and I'm going to keep doing it. Uh, and that is acknowledge you guys, one, as a family. My wife, Jennifer, and I, we go here to Freedom House. Uh, how many of you have ever said hi to me before out in the lobby? Any of you have met? Yeah, we met, I met a few of you. Uh, we've been going here for about seven or eight months now. A uh, neat story about how we found out about Freedom House, and uh, uh, we'll tell you about that one later. But uh, you guys have been awesome to us, and so really happy to be here sharing with you today. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge your pastors. Um, the staff, one here, just so you know, the staff here is awesome. The volunteers here, the people that, <clears throat> the people over the, child, the children's ministry. How many of you have children that are out in the children's ministry? Don't they do an awesome job? And then, and then also, how about the praise and worship folks up here? They rock it. They're awesome. Um, but Pastor Troy and Penny, um, I'll tell you, a lot of times, if you don't know them, if you haven't gotten to meet them before, even if today's your first time or you've been here before and you haven't quite gotten to meet them, if you've ever wondered if they are as cool as they appear to be, um, I will tell you that they are. And uh, Penny mentioned that I get to travel a lot. God has opened a lot of doors for me to go and speak to different places, corporations, churches. And I'll tell you, I meet a lot of people in ministry. And, you know, they're all great people. But I'll tell you that the pastors that you have here are special. They're unique. They care about you guys. They care about this church. And they care about what's happening in Charlotte. And so before we get started today, would you guys give Pastor Troy and Pastor Penny a big, big, huge round of applause? Awesome. <clears throat> cool. Awesome. Whole family is awesome. All of them. Awesome. So <clears throat> let me tell you kind of how this started, uh, this series. Uh, Pastor Troy called me, this was probably about three weeks ago, and he said, uh, I want you to kick off this, service, uh, this sermon series for us at Freedom House. And I was like, all right. He said, I think you'd be the perfect guy for it. And I was like, okay. I was like, so I'd be perfect for it? And he was like, yep, you'd be perfect for it. And I was like, well, and I started thinking, I was like, so what is, what's it going to be about? I was like, is it how to be an awesome husband? Because I am that. <laughs> or is it how to be an awesome daddy? Because I'm a daddy. How many of you daddies in here? I'm going, how many, how many dads you got in here? Yeah. And so I thought, how to be an awesome daddy? Because that'd be me. And then I thought, maybe it was just a sermon about how to be super sexy, cool, in a humble kind of Christian way. <laughs> I kicked that one off too. And I said, yes, yeah, so Troy, no problem. I'll do it. Whatever. What do you want, man? What, what, what's the series about? He said, well, we're going to call it Mad Men. <laughs> He says about how all the disciples in some ways were crazy. And I thought, you want me to kick that off? He's like, yeah, I think you'd be perfect for it. I'm like, well, here's the deal, Troy, T-Roy, let me tell you something. I'm not crazy. I hear the voices, I just don't argue with them like I used to. <laughs> so anyway, but what we want to do, guys, today, we're going to start a, a series called Mad Men. And how many of you know that, that, that to be a disciple, can you imagine back then to be a disciple, and even some today, how much they were ridiculed, how, how hard it was on them. I mean, sometimes we come to church, and, and, and if we find out that the coffee machine is not working or something out in the lobby, we think we're suffering for Christ, right? You know, I, I can't get my white chocolate mocha. <laughs> anyway, um, but the disciples went through it. I mean, they struggled, and, and, and the, the church hated them back then. They thought that they were, they thought they were crazy. They were lost. They wanted to throw them in jail. They beat them. Uh, they were murdered. I mean, it was tough being a disciple. You had to be a little bit crazy. And so when I started thinking about this, I was like, well, who do I want to talk about? Who do I want to, want to start talking about? And so the first person that I thought of was Peter. Peter, Peter was kind of crazy, was he not? You guys know, know much about Peter? Peter was the kind of guy who would say stuff, and then as soon as he would stay, say it, I know that the rest of the disciples, and probably him, it, it was probably like, man, I wish you'd put that back in your mouth. Have you ever, have you ever done that before? How many of you have ever been in an argument before with your, with your spouse or someone else, and you've said something, and as soon as you said it, you were like... I need to put that back in my mouth. Any of you do that? My, my wife, Jennifer, is here, who, who I'm very thankful is here. It's my best friend in the whole world. She's an awesome support to me when I travel and speak. She goes with me some, but, but amazing woman. But, but just so you guys know, my wife and I, we do not have arguments. We don't argue. We have a vigorous exchange of dissenting ideas. That's what we call it. <laughs> and so I thought about it. I was like, well, who is it, Peter? And then I started thinking, well, you know what? I don't think I want to talk about Peter because I went to, I was in, 
Yakima, Washington, uh, Spokane, Washington this past week, and I was on the plane thinking, who do I want to talk about? And then what came to me was Judas. He was the, he was the, the maddest man of all, so, so to speak. So I was like, all right, so I want to start, and I want to talk about Judas. And so what I want to do here is I want to read out of the scriptures. It's, it's Matthew 26. If you guys want to turn there, it's Matthew 26, verse 14. And how many of you, how many of you have your Bibles with you today? How many of you got your Bibles? Awesome, awesome. Um, Matthew 26, verse 14. When you get to that, uh, if you're there... Uh, when you get there, say amen. You're already there. Wow, good, good, good. Matthew, very easy book to find. First book in the New Testament, right, right after Genesis. You'll find that, no problem. Um, if you're there, say amen. If you're still not there, say hallelujah. Oh, there's a few of you. Okay, we'll give you a second. But here's, let me go ahead and jump into this. Hopefully you guys have got it by now. Matthew chapter 26, verse 14 this is uh, a list of the disciples. Um, oh, actually, you know what? I, I'm in the wrong scripture. Let me flip back. <laughs> See, I'm the trickster. I'm, I'm already in character. I'm the madman today. I'm Judas. Uh, flip back to, to Matthew chapter 10. Sorry about that, guys. Matthew chapter 10, verse 2. Sorry about that. Matthew chapter 10, verse 2. And this is the list of the disciples. This is a list of their names, and then we're going to flip over to 26 in just a minute. Matthew chapter 10, verse 2, uh, it says, these are the names of the 12 apostles. You got first, you got Simon, uh, who is called Peter. The next is his brother Andrew. Next, you got James, the son of Zebedee. You got his brother John. You got Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So I was like, man, that's a pretty good description of everybody, you know, just their name, where they came from. And then you've got Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Pretty good, right? Imagine having that one on your resume. <laughs> I'm the one that betrayed him. Can you imagine that one? But here's the thing. How many of you know that, that here in America, you, you probably know people that have done this, or maybe it's even you, but in America, one of the things that I've noticed is that we name our family members, our children, we name them very, very strong biblical names. You guys notice that we do that? And so a lot of times you'll meet a family and they're like, hi, how you doing? And they're like, this is our, our children. It's our children. This is Abraham. You want to say, hey, Abraham? <laughs> Abraham's like, hey, hallelujah, how you doing? <laughs> then you got Isaac, the other one, right? The brother, Isaac. Hey, Isaac. Isaac's like, how you doing? Isaac's got his WWJD t-shirt on. That way you know, you know, it's Isaac. Then the other one, younger one, Jacob, right? And they named the two girls, Mary and Martha, right? That's our two girls, Mary and Martha. And then the, the, the sixth child, check this one out, the sixth kid, and you don't ever see this one, but can you imagine this one? The sixth kid, well, <clears throat> this is Judas Iscariot. <laughs> can you imagine that one? They'd be like, uh, Judas, back up, back away, throwing holy water on him, put your shot collar back on Judas, it's not your time right now. But there's a lot in a name, and here's the thing, I, 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 I could speak on this, the book of Matthew actually starts out with genealogy. And so it's important for us to know who we are and who we came from. But this list, this name of the disciples, as you see it, Judas was the one that betrayed him. So what we're going to do here in just a minute is I'm going to talk to you about what Judas did. How many of you know what Judas is most well known for? Come on, I just said it. How many of you know that anytime you've heard the word Judas in your life, you knew what that meant, right? You thought, oh, he was, he was the bad guy. He was the bad guy. I thought about talking today about what that meant for the other disciples. Because let's go ahead and flip over. If you flip to Matthew 26, where I had you in the first place. I was just getting ahead of myself there. So excited to share this with you. Matthew 26, verse 14, where we were. It says, Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, he went to the chief priests and he asked them, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? And so they counted out for him 30 silver coins. And from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. So I thought today, I was like, well, how, how, how can I approach this? What, what do I want to do with this? And one of the things that came to me, and I'm not going to talk about it today, but one of the things that came to me today was how sneaky Judas must have been because he hung out with the disciples for a long time. I mean, he, Jesus called him. Uh, when he called the other disciples, it says that immediately they came and they followed him. They dropped what they were doing. Judas had been around. He had seen the miracles. He had been with the other guys, but they didn't know it. How many of you know that in the end, Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, and none of them knew who it was going to be. How many of you knew that? How many of you knew that? So Judas was pretty sneaky. And so what I want to talk to you about today is, one, is some sneaky things that can creep up in your life and in my life that can keep us from creating the life that I believe God wants for us. 
How many, right, how many of you right now would say that there are some things in your life that you know, that you experience, I don't know that you experience them daily, but quite often, that are creeping up in your life and they're keeping you from living the life that you know God wants for you? How many of you, how many of you deal with some of that in your life? How many of you get angry, by the way? Come on, how many of you get angry? If you're not raising your hand, here's the, how many of you have been angry today? Come on, it's all right. Some of you are raising both hands. That's cool, I got it. Here's the deal, and I said this last service. You, you can't live in this flesh suit that God has given us without getting frustrated. Even the scripture says, be angry, but sin not. We're going to get angry, but the question is, how do you handle it? How do you handle it? Somebody cuts you off in traffic, how do you handle it? I mean, what happens? Come on, what goes on for you, right? Right? And so we want to talk today about what kind of sneaks up, what comes up in your life, like Judas, so to speak, because we're, this is what we're talking about, the mad men, some things that are coming up for you that you may be experiencing that we want to kind of get past today, or at least learn to recognize them so that we can create more of what we want and what God wants for us. So I took the word Judas. I thought, all right, how are we going to make this applicable? So I took the word Judas, and I broke it down, J-U-D-A-N-S, J-U-D-A-S. That's how you spell Judas, right? I think. I don't think I spelled it wrong. Is that right? J-U-D-A-S, right? And each letter represents a word, which I'm going to suggest to you is something that may be in your life that's creeping up, that's sneaky, that you don't even see it coming, and you don't even know that it's there, but it's keep you from walking out the thing that God wants for you. And so for me, the J, the word that came to mind, was judgment. Now, judgment is something that, you know, we hear people all the time, oh, you shouldn't judge. But I want to talk to you today, one, about judging other people but also about judging yourself. Because here's what happens, guys. When we get frustrated ourselves or we judge our situation, we judge where we're at, we judge how we look, we judge where we're working, we judge the amount of money that we make, we judge the car that we're driving, we go into judgment. If we don't think that that's where we should be, we get frustrated, and then we pull out something that I call the golden hammer. So how many of you have a golden hammer? You guys know what I'm talking about with a golden hammer? The golden hammer is the thing that you keep underneath your bed, and when you do something that you don't think you should do, you pull it out and you beat yourself over the head with it. How many of you do that? Come on. How many of you, how many of you have a little negative voice in your head sometimes? It's like blah, 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 blah. How many of you have that? How many of you have a couple of them? Is that any of you? Yeah? Okay. So the golden hammer thing, you pull out, you go into judgment, and you beat yourself over the head. That's judging yourself. The second part of judgment is where you go and you judge other people. And I'm just going to tell you straight up. I get to talk in, in quite a few churches. And a lot of the times, guys, when I'm in front of people that don't do church, one of the reasons is they don't do church is because they don't want to be judged by the people that are sitting in the pews. One of the things that I think we're doing a horrible job at, not here at Freedom House, I just mean as the body of Christ, one of the things that we're doing horrible at is our outreach. We come into church, we get really comfortable, we think, well, this is my seat, this is where I'm going to sit, and if this church grows too much, I might lose my seat, so I'm not going to tell the people on my job how awesome Jesus is and how awesome Freedom House Church is. I'm going to find a way to judge them and put a distance between me and them and keep myself safe. Now, some of you are like, well, what do you mean by keeping yourself safe? Here's what happens, guys. I'm going to tell you something. When you throw up judgment between you and someone else, this is something that we all do. We put labels on someone else. What it does, guys, is it puts a distance or a separation between us and another person. And we put a distance between us and another person. It, it, it hinders us from being able to share the love of God with them and what Jesus has done in our life. Would you guys agree? Because here, here, here's what I want you to get. We don't reproduce what we teach. We reproduce what we are. Okay, and so Jesus would preach to the masses, but he would spend intimate quality time with the disciples. And in that intimate time, his spirit was reproduced in them, and he knew that he could then tell them to go out and make disciples of men. Does this make any sense to you? It was in those intimate times. We talk about being a daddy. The way that I became a daddy was intimacy. The way we become parents, it's intimacy. Come on, we're mature. That's what happens. For us to reproduce our spirit, we have to be intimate with other people, and that is be in conversation with them, open up to them, get to know them so that we can share the love of Christ. So then they go, wait a minute, there's something about you that I want. And then when they say, well, what is it about you? And you say, well, there's this book I've been reading. I'm like, well, what is it? I have people ask me this all the time. I'll go speak at an event. And they're like, man, whatever you said today, it just really resonated with me. I'm like, really? They're like, yeah. 
I'm like, well, I've been reading this book. They're like, really? I'm like, yeah. They're like, what is it? I'm like, ah, you wouldn't read it anyway. <laughs> They're like, yeah, I would. I'm like, no, you probably wouldn't. They're like, no, I would, really. Tell me what it is. I'm like, you serious? You'd read it? You'll read the book I tell you to read. Like, yeah. I'm like, it'll get you a red letter King James Version of the Bible. <laughs> if you're a business person, how many business people we got in here? How many of you are business people in here? Here's the deal. That's the greatest business book on the planet. It is. It is. One of my mentors, he said that he started tithing two years before he even started going to church because his mentor had him reading the Bible. See, we're the only Bible that some people will ever see. You see, and if we're judging people because of the amount of money they make, where they're from, sexual orientation, what po political party that they're with, how they look, how they dress, whatever, then there's a separation between us and them. And people want to be heard and they want to be loved. And I'll tell you, one of the things that we're doing in the church is people show up. They don't dress like we want them to dress. They don't look like we think we, they should look. They don't act how we think they should act. And one of the things that the church is notorious for is killing the wounded. People show up hurting. We pull our gun out and we go, you know what? You're not welcome here. We're, we've got it figured out. It's, it's us against the world. No, it's not. We've got to go into the world. We've got to be able to go out. I'm telling you, we are called... Look, look, we are called to be disciples, and that's to go out and let people see what it is that we're doing and go, wait a minute, I want what they've got. Because if people aren't asking us what it is about us that's working, then shame on us. We've got to be the people that God has called us to be, and if we can get past this judgment thing, God's going to use us in an awesome way. So my challenge for you today is make this applicable is maybe you write down the name of someone that you want to connect with or that you have wanted to connect with, but you haven't been able to or you haven't created an opportunity to talk to them. Maybe it's on your job. Maybe it's someone in your neighborhood. You know, we're so connected on the Internet, Facebook, Twitter, but we're so disconnected relationally amongst the people that we're around. Judgment's a big part of that, and that'll sneak into our life. I do it. We all do it. We put labels on things. Some of you guys labeled me before I even got up here today. I walked up here, and you were like, well, that ain't Pastor Troy. He ain't as good looking as Pastor Troy. I beg to differ. <laughs> Come on. Do we not do that? Come on, do you do it? Come on, you walk into a room and you go, I'm not going to talk to them. Not going to talk to them. I might talk to them. Yeah, those look like some people I talk to. And then you just beat your feet right over to those people and you start talking to them. And you don't even know you do it. It's subconscious it's programmed into us, guys. The world is telling us that we're supposed to judge people. And here's the deal, guys. Judgment is about survival. Please hear me. The reason that we label situations that we walk into is because we don't want to get hurt. We go in and we start looking around. It's survival, and it works. But there's a huge difference between surviving and thriving. And I think God wants us to thrive. He wants us to experience the joy and the peace and the relationships. Because when God wants to bless us, he sends a person. We need to be better at relationships. And here's what I'm going to tell you. If you want a relationship with someone and you struggle with a relationship, let me tell you who the first person you need to be in relationship with. And that's our Father God. Because when you know, here, please hear me, because when you know whose you are and you have your identity in Christ and when you're in alignment with that, I'll tell you, this world becomes so much more joyful. There's so much more peace out there. I'm telling you, that's what this is all about. So we got to get past the judgment. That's the J. That's the J. So here's the U. The U is unworthiness. The U stands for unworthiness. How many of you have ever been in a place in your life where you felt like you weren't worthy of what you believe you were supposed to do with your life. Come on, how many of you have ever experienced that before? How many of you struggle a little bit with self-confidence? Come on, be honest. If you're not raising your hand, I'm telling you, I've never met anyone that would say that I'm as confident as I need to be and that I never struggle with self-confidence. I'm gonna tell you, unworthiness is something that will sneak up. It'll creep up on you in your life and it'll cause you to feel like you can't do what it is that God has called you to do. Let me give you an example. How am I speaking that? Everything that I'm saying to you today, I'm talking to myself because I'm thinking about in my life where I felt like I was unworthy. One of the ways that this started for me as I look back is when I wanted to be in ministry. I felt like my whole life God had called me to ministry, but one thing that I always did is I looked at where I came, what I had done, who I was, things I'd said, people I'd hung out with, and I thought, God, you can't use me. I went through some stuff in my life. There is no way, God, that you can use me. And as long as the enemy can paralyze us with unworthiness, we won't do the things God has called us to do. Because when God calls us to something, it's going to be something that's going to require him. It's probably going to be bigger than what, what most people would think that we could accomplish. And so unworthiness is huge. And so I'll tell you what happened with me. I grew up thinking I want to be in ministry. I prayed about it, prayed about it, prayed about it. And in, June of 2000, in January of 2006, I had an accident. 
I was playing basketball. A friend of mine threw me an alley-oop. I'm a jumper. I've always been able to hop. got long legs, right? I can hop. I jump up. I grab the rim, try to dunk the ball, grab the rim. My feet slide out. My, they swing out because I went in really fast. I let go of the rim, and I basically cartwheel around, and I fall on a concrete floor, shiny new concrete floor. Stomp your feet. Stomp your feet. That's hard concrete. I dove into that concrete perfectly. I crushed both my wrists. I got plates in both my arms now. Actually, I just removed one not long ago, but I had plates in my arms. I go through this. My mom and my stepfather come down to Atlanta, Georgia, because that's where I, I was living at the time. And my stepfather's physician, he comes down. He's going to be with me there during the surgery. He comes down, stays with me uh, during the surgery. After the surgery's over, I come out. They've got me casted up from my fingers to my shoulders. And I come out of the surgery. They cast me up, all this stuff. My, my stepfather leaves to drive home. He gets on I-85 to come home from Atlanta. And on the way home, he starts coughing really bad. And he goes to the hospital to see his patients, but he had started coughing really bad and feeling so bad that he checked himself into the hospital and didn't see his patients. They immediately put him on a breathing machine, life support. I never saw him again. So I come out of this, this experience of having this accident, and now I've busted my hands up. I've got plates in my hands. Now I've lost my stepfather, who was a great friend of mine, a guy that I looked up to in my life. And I started thinking, God, what are you trying to do in my life? What's going on? Because when that happened, one of the things that I realized, guys, was that life can come at you quickly. We think in our mind that we have forever to do things. And there's an old saying that the road to someday leads to a town of nowhere. Because we can get caught up going, well, next week I'm going to do this. Next week I'm going to have the conversations that I need to have with the people that I love. I'm going to tell my spouse how awesome they are and how important they are to me. One day I'm going to get to that. We don't know that we have another day, guys. These things come up quick. And so when that happened for me, I said, all right, God, what is it that you're trying to do in my life? And God said, don't go back to what you've been doing. And so in that moment, I made a commitment. When I heard that, I made a commitment. I'm going into ministry. I knew, I've had, I, knew I was going to do it my whole life, but I didn't believe I was worthy of doing it. But if you're telling me to do it, do it. I'll do it. And I committed to it. Now, please write this down. If you're taking notes, write this down. I had wanted ministry my whole life, but I wasn't committed to it. It's not what you want that matters. It's what you're committed to in your life that you'll get. Some people say they want a more intimate, loving, powerful relationship, but their real commitment is to always being in control of their spouse. Some people say, I want a better relationship with my teenagers, but their real commitment is to always be abrasive and controlling and talk down to their children. That's their commitment. You will get what you are committed to. I committed to ministry, and I'll tell you what happened, guys. As God started opening doors for me, I met my pastor in Atlanta. Troy's in, in Atlanta this week. Troy's in Atlanta this week preaching. The church that I came out of in Atlanta is a, a, a huge church. Thousands of people at this church. I had never met my pastor ever before. In the middle of the night, the Lord spoke to me and said, send that man an email. And I sent him an email, and I said, look, I busted my hands up. I've lost my stepfather. I'm thinking about moving from Atlanta back to North Carolina, Winston-Salem, where my family's at now. I think I'm going back. And my pastor said, come meet me. So I went and met him one day. We sat down. We had lunch. And for the next three or four months, we went to lunch every week. We started spending a lot of time together. And on June 20th, my birthday, he took me to lunch. He said, I want you to wear a black suit to church next week. When you come to church, I want you to wear a black suit. I'm going to ordain you. He ordained me into ministry, and doors started opening. And since then, it's been almost six years now, I've been in seven different countries, churches, corporations, you name it. I've been in front of people, and it's all because... I got committed to something, and I got past this feeling of unworthiness. When we get past unworthiness and we stop saying, you know what, I'm not going to believe that anymore. I'm going to believe the promises that God has for me. When we start doing that, God will start using us in an amazing way. Where before, all we get to do is be right about how we can't do it. And that's something that will keep us from doing it. 1 Peter 2 and 9 says, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen people, a people that belong to God. We all belong to God, and so does everybody else out there. They just don't know it yet. It's up to us to get out there and share that. So the you in Judas is unworthiness. The D. Now, this is one that I like to talk about a lot because I see it a lot. The D is something that goes down a lot in organizations. Big corporations, small businesses, families. The D is divisiveness divisiveness and basically one word to describe what divisiveness is guys 
is this one. It's gossip. Gossip will kill an organization. It will kill a church. It'll kill a company. It'll kill a marriage. It'll kill a relationship. It kills families. How? Because we, we, we separate ourselves. And, and the Bible says that one of the things that God hates in Proverbs chapter 6, it says he hates someone that causes division amongst the brotherhood. It says he hates that. Lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, and divisiveness. That's gossip. So here's my challenge for you today, because I always want to make these things applicable. I don't want to just preach at you today. I want, when you leave here today, you know, you know what? I, I'm really going to step into some of these things. I'm going to do this, because this is what we do. We come to get a word on Sunday, but we've got to start walking it out the rest of the week. Would you agree with me on that? Because here's what can happen. You can come and get a word, and you can sit on it the rest of the week, and you just get fat on it. But it's not blessing anybody else. We're blessed to be a blessing to the rest of the world, guys. That's what, that's what God is trying to do in our lives. And so that's who we want to be. So if you feel like at any point during this week, and from this point forward, if you're around someone and, and they start talking negatively about someone else, maybe it's even something that's not true, but you feel like, you know, I don't think you need to be saying that. What I would challenge you to do is say, is that other person that you're talking about, are they here to defend themselves? Because if they're not, <laughs> we don't need to be having this conversation. Or you can take it to a whole nother level, which gets a little bit uncomfortable sometimes, and people don't like to be uncomfortable. I think most people are addicted to comfort. I tell people all the time, don't judge people that are addicted to alcohol, addicted to drugs. Most of us are addicted to comfort. It's the same addiction, it's just a different drug. <laughs> you watch somebody who's stepping outside their comfort zone, what do they do? They start acting like they need a fix. They, get, they twitch, they get sweaty palms, cotton mouth. Oh, I'm out of my comfort zone. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Watch what happens. We shoot, in, we shoot comfort right in our vein. Oh, Lord, that feels good. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Get, tell somebody, you're in that kind of uh, conversation. Say, let's, get, let's go take this to the person. Let's talk about this with them to see what's really going on. That'll cut that off right there. Jesus said, cut it off at the root. That's what'll happen. That's divisiveness. That's the D. Here's the A. I'm watching my time click down here. I'm not even going to look at it. I'm going to sit back here. I can see it's on the screen right here. I'm just going to block it out. The A, guys, the A in Judas in this for me was attachment. Attachment. Now, there's a few things that I think we can get attached to, but one of the things I want to talk most about is our story. So let me tell you kind of what I mean about the, the, the first couple of things in attachment. The first thing in attachment is attachment to people. Attachment to people. Now, somebody told me a long time ago that people are like elevators. They'll take you up. Guess what else they'll do? They'll take you down. And they'll get you stuck. They'll take you up, they'll take you down, they'll get you stuck. Now, you, you know that there are people out there that will take you up. They're the people that you hang around, that they encourage you, they speak into your life. And let me throw this little sound bite in here really quick. We need to be encouraging our children and speaking into them what they are doing well. We do. Now, see, here's the thing. It says, raise up a child. You guys know this one? Train up a child, what? In the way that they should go. Do you know that the word way means bend? And what makes a road unique is the bend in the road. That's how you know one road from the other. And so we raise up a child in the way or the bend. We speak to our children in what's unique to them, and they will grow into that. Instead of telling our children what they're not doing right and how they're not smart enough and how they're not good enough and they're not going to make it, instead we start saying, you know what, you're awesome at doing this. You're an awesome communicator. You're an awesome child. You're, an aw you're, you're a giver. You're the, we're proud of you. We speak to that. Our children will conform to that instead of speaking at them of where they used to be. And so people, we want to be around people, guys, that, that, that want to take us up. But then there are the people that will take us down. You guys know those. You ever talk to somebody before, even before you get anything out of your mouth, they're already like, no, you shouldn't do that. No way, man. You need to get a real job. <laughs> Nobody ever makes it doing that. No, no. Those are the people that take you down. But then here's the one that we want to look out for. The one that we want to look out for, guys, are the ones that get us stuck. Because they're the ones that we don't see. Now, as I'm saying this, some of you might be thinking of someone, and, and I'm not telling you that as soon as you walk out here today, go, you know, Ronnie came to church today, and he wanted me to call you and tell you that I think that you've got me stuck. Because <laughs> here's something. I'm going to throw this in real quick. We can't be victims to what other people do in our life. See, we're called to be responsible. See, if I go victim to how my wife acts sometimes or how my daughter might act, and they, they're... they're most of the time, they're pretty good. 
They do all right. But no, come on, we go victim to how our boss is. We go victim to how our coworkers are. And we don't stay committed to who we know that we are. We surrender the power that God has given us to create. And we go victim to other things. So we've got to be real careful about the attachment to people. The other thing is you want to watch out for the attachment to your possessions. And I'm going to give you this one really quick, just a thought for you. How many of you own an iPad, an iPod, or an iPhone? Come on, raise your hand. That's pretty much everybody. When I fly on the plane, I'll tell you about 50 to 60% of the people have an iPad up front. Here's the deal. I've got one. I own one, iPhone, all that stuff. got one. Well, I had one. I had an iPad until I left it in the seat back pocket at a Delta Airlines flight. And they just, <laughs> they just didn't happen to recover it. It was weird. Nobody found it. That odd. Came on, I was like, Lord, how could that be? It's a hot item. But here's the thing that I noticed about I. It's all about I, 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 I this, I that. And I get on Facebook, I get on Twitter. It's all about me. It's I, I, I. It's what I want to do. Anything that distracts us from relationship with God, it's a sin. I don't mean to say you can't have these things, enjoy these things. Come on, I'm going to keep my iPhone, my iPad, the one that I'm going to buy. <laughs> the second one, the iPad 2, the original, the second one for me. But I'm going to have those things. But we have to do things in moderation. Anything that takes us away and we see this at the holidays. Come on, you get around the holidays, everybody's talking about Santa Claus. Come on. You rearrange the letters to Santa, you got Satan. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Something for you to think about. Come on, anything that distracts us from the reason that we have Christ in our life and Chris, I'm telling you, just something to think about. And I love Christmas Santa. My, my daughter loves to go sit on her lap. My wife sits on Santa's lap, tell her what she wants. Anyway, last year she asked for a good husband. I was like, what, girl? Anyway, <laughs> but we've got to watch our attachment to possessions. Don't need to be chasing things down. If God wants to have it, it'll come to us. We've got to go do the work, pray like it's all up to God, work like it's all up to us. Those things will come, but we want to be in balance, moderation with all those things. And then the last thing in attachment, I want to get through this one really quick, it's really important, is the attachment to your story. Now, some of you are like, well, what do you mean by that, Ron? What do you, what do you mean? Attachment to your story is this. I want you to take your notes out there. If you're taking notes, I want you to draw a cross really quickly on your notes. There in a section where you got somewhere to draw. Draw a cross. Big enough, you know, maybe four inches, three, four inches. Big enough to where you can write something on each side of it. I want you to draw a cross. In the top left side of the cross, I want you to put the word fact. I want you to write the word fact in the top left corner. In the top right corner, I want you to write the word meaning. Okay? Now, fact meaning. Here's what I want you to understand is it's not so important what happens to us in our life as what we make all of that mean. Let me say that again. It's not so important what happened to you in your life, it's what you make it mean. And human beings are meaning-making machines. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, you attach a meaning to it. Somebody looks at you the wrong way, you attach a meaning to it. And what happens is, is we take certain facts, we attach meanings to them, and then we collapse the cross. And then our facts and our meanings become one and the same. And we start to write this story about how the world is. And we carry that story with us everywhere we go. And so when I show up, I'm like, well, you don't know where I've been through. I was molested as a kid. And then walked out on me. They don't love me. All these different things went on. And you know what? We've created this story. And that's what we believe about ourselves. And the book of Proverbs says, is, as a man or woman thinketh in their heart, so are they. So if I believe that the world's no good and nobody loves me and nobody cares about me, that all the people in the church are just mean and they want something from me, if I believe that, that's what I'll find. But if I believe that God has something for me in my life and that he has a purpose for me, and that's where I find my identity is in the word of God, I'll go out with a different story. And here's what I want to tell you today, is that you are writing the story of your life every day. You're writing the story of your life every day. So I'm going to challenge you to forget about the story that you've been telling yourself that ain't working for you. Because here's the deal. I'll ask people sometimes, I'll go, what's something you went through in your life? What's something that you went through, a powerful experience, either negative, positive, whatever it was, that you went through? And I've had women. I had a woman one time in the room. I asked that question. A woman raises her hand, and she says, I went through a divorce. And I said, well, well what did you make that mean? And she said, it meant I was unlovable. She said, it meant I was no good. It meant I wasn't a good wife. It meant I wasn't a good mother. He didn't want me. That's what it meant to me. And I said, is there anybody else in here that's ever gone through a divorce? And this lady on the other side of the room, she raises her hand. She says, yeah, I, I've been through a divorce. I said, would you stand up for me? She said, stood up. I said, what did you make it mean? She said, it meant I was free. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Now, now, please hear me on this. I said, that's what you meant it mean. She goes, yes, he was physically and verbally abusive to me. It wasn't a safe place for me to have my, family, my children anymore. She said, it was time for me to go on. And let me, let me tell you this. You want to attach some meaning to it. If someone has walked out of your life, guys, then they were not imperative for your destiny. If someone walks out on your life, they are not imperative to your destiny and where God wants to take you. So if someone's walked out on you, they said something ugly about you, and you say, God bless you, thank you so much. I know you weren't imperative for my destiny, and you keep walking towards what it is God has called you to do. You gotta watch that attachment. Watch the attachment, because here's the deal. I asked the group, I said, who's writing the story there? And they said, well, they are. They're writing the story. And I said, so who's writing the story in your life? They said, we are. I said, so if you're writing the story in your life, why wouldn't you write a, a story in your life that will make you the happiest, most peaceful, most abundant, most joyful, most awesome person that you can be around because you're writing the story. That's what attachment is. We've got to get past the attachment to an old story because I'm going to tell you, God wants to do amazing things in our lives. And the problem is sometimes we just won't let him do it. That's the attachment. And here's the last thing. It's the S. I'm going to give this one to you really quick. And the S, guys... It's what I call scarcity or scarcity thinking. It's scarcity. It's the thinking of lack. There's not enough. I don't make enough money to give. I don't make enough money to, to bless people's life. I, I don't make enough money for our family to go on a trip. That, that, that's scarcity thinking. The scripture said that John came, uh, that Jesus came. In, in, in the scripture of John 10, 10, it said that Jesus came and we have life and we have it more abundantly. And I know that you hear that a lot and you've heard that scripture, but it's true. God wants to bless us in every area of our life. He does. It doesn't mean things aren't going to be challenging. It doesn't mean things aren't going to be hard. They are. But God's waiting to bless us. And it's all about the commitment. It's all about taking the step. Because here's the deal. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. I can stand around and say, God's going to do this. God's going to do it. But if I don't ever take that first step and move toward it and start doing the things that God's called us to do, then I might not, I might not ever produce the things that I know God wants for me. It's up to us. We have a responsibility. Scarcity thinking. I would challenge you to take a look at scarcity. Are you not giving? Are you not volunteering? Not just here. I'm talking about out there. Your job, you're not showing up. Don't think scarcity. That's something that runs through all of this. Scarcity is lack, and God is not a God of lack at all. And we're not supposed to be either. That doesn't mean we're always going to be rich, loaded, pockets full. But we give. God opens doors for us. That's what it's all about. Don't let scarcity hinder your thinking. You plan a trip that you want to take your family on. You find a, a, a restaurant. Take your wife out on a date, your husband out on a date. Go out. I invest in romance. It's so worth it. <laughs> My wife's going to take me out right after we're done today. <laughs> Come on, somebody. But these are some of the things. It's the judgment, the unworthiness, the divisiveness, the attachment. And the scarcity that will keep us from creating what God wants in our life. And the last thing I want to give you, last thing I want to give you, is that Matthew 27, in verse 3, you can look at it. It says that Jesus took all the silver coins, Judas took all the silver coins, Judas took all the silver coins that the high priest had given him. And he took it back to him and said, I don't want this. He said, I betrayed innocent blood. And he took the money and he threw it back in. And he threw it at him, and he left. And it says that he went on, he actually committed suicide. He went on, and, and, and Judas couldn't take it anymore. But here's what I'll tell you. If a devil recognized how awesome Jesus was, can't we do the same? When we're up against it, and we're saying, you know what, God, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know that Jesus came, that I'd have life and have it more abundantly. If we'll stand on that instead of standing on what the world is telling us, that you're not enough, you'll never have that enough, you can't do this, we stand on that, we're not going to do it. But when we stand on what God has promised and we operate that in that, God is going to do things in our life that we never even thought possible. God wants to do stuff for you today. If you guys would, if you stand up with me today, stand up. How many of you feel like you've received something from this today? Did you get anything out of this today? Last thing I want you to do, I want you to ask that you grab a hand by somebody, somebody sitting next to you. Grab a hand. You can cross the aisle there if you want. Do whatever you want to do. Grab hands of someone sitting next to you. And here's what I'd ask. If there's something that I said today that you know that if you take it out from here and apply it, if you can get past some judgment towards someone, connect with that person, share some love with them, love on them. If you know that that's you and there's somebody that you thought of today, I'm going to challenge you to go ahead and do that. I'm going to challenge you to do it. 
and also if today was the day that you came here and, and you feel like that the world has kind of beat you down and, and that people have said things about you and it's just been too hard, but you want to make a new commitment today to Christ, if you want to make recommit to Christ today, you can just slip up your hand. If you want to do that, I know you're holding some hands of people beside you. Don't, don't matter what they think. Don't worry about that. They're here to support you and love you. I know this house. The reason that we, my wife and I come here, this is a healthy place. People here love you. The pastors love you. We love you. You can slip up your hand. But if today's the day that you want to commit to Christ, you've never committed. You say, God, I've been doing things this way, but I know you have something better for me. I'm going to tell you that God is waiting on you. He wants you. Jesus wants relationship with you. He does. And if that's you, what I'm going to ask that you do is that after service, you just go out. You just go outside to the, the welcome desk. It's right here in the lobby. And they're going to give you a packet. It's what now? And it's the new packet about how to get connected here at Freedom House and how to get involved because there's some great people in this room that want to love on you and support you. We just want to help you to encourage you to get what it is that God has got for you in your life. And here's the thing. You deserve it. You deserve it. And God loves you. Father, thank you so much for today. We thank you for this house that you built, God, using us. Father, we thank you for the opportunities that you have given us in our life, even the ones maybe that we missed, maybe the ones that we overlooked, God, because we just couldn't see it. We were just so caught up that we missed it. God, I'd ask today that you pour out your spirit in a way that we've never experienced it before and that, God, you would just show us how much you love us in every opportunity, God. And when we grow to doubt and someone puts something in front of us that would cause us to, to think that we can't and that we're not worth it and we can't do it, God, that we would just remember the words that you've spoken. And God, we just thank you so much for today. We thank you for every person that's here, every household that's represented. And God, I just speak a, a special a special blessing of protection for the people that are here and a hedge of protection around their families, God. Because, God, we want to be used by you. You just send us where you tell us to go, God, and we'll do the work. God, we love you. Thank you so much for loving on us. Thank you for, for filling us with your spirit, God. Thank you for protecting us. Thank you for our families, our friends, our relationships, and thank you for this church, God. We just ask today, God, that everything that was spoken would take root and bear fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give God a hand clap of praise. All right. God bless you. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks.